beautiful people. So many of you are asking about this and I'm so glad you are. It means you're reading, it means you're paying attention. It means you're concerned and that's good. So unfortunately I have just been so slammed and so busy since this channel started. And this is such a dense topic. It took a long time to research. Back when I first started using Amanita, I was concerned about the same thing, but also I wanted to leave a lot of articles for you to do your own research. So what I've done, because the last strike I got on my channel was their bots mistaking a link to something and it, I shouldn't have gotten the strike, but they locked me out for a week. So I am not willing to risk it. All of these are research articles, but there's a lot of them. So I've been going through these over the last month. And what I've done is I've gone to our forum and I started a post, a topic about uh, heavy metals and Amanita. And all I did was just dump all the articles there. So, so if you want to find the forum, you'll have to go to the description. Most people don't even realize a description exists for these videos. So if you look under the video right here, you'll see like an upside down little triangle pointing downward. If you click that, it'll open it up. And it's tiny on a phone, but it'll open up the description. And I have a link to the forum there. And you just go to the forum and do a search for metals and Amanita or just go to the general boards and you'll see it. So what I've done is I've taken some notes real quick on this. And I can't just say, hey, it's safe, hey, it's not safe, because I won't ever make that claim about any Amanita or anything that you ingest. I won't ever say that. <laughs> what I am gonna do is give you the science so that you can learn and go off on your own. So let me disclaimer this by saying, I am one person on my channel. I don't have a team of investigators doing research and bringing it back to me. So I could make a mistake or maybe I missed a study because there's so many. What I'm not gonna do in the comments section is explain data to you because I just don't have time. I'm not trying to be an asshole about it. You can just learn how to read data, but you don't just read a table and go, oh my God, look at that. You've got to look at it in its context and ask the right questions. So what I'm going to be doing in this video is synthesizing the data and telling you my thought processes and how I got here, how I analyzed all the data, right? If you don't understand statistical analysis or logical, thinking or how to analyze and be critical of data, then you have to trust somebody. And if you don't trust me, find someone you do trust and you can get on the forum underneath that post where I left all the research and you can just ask questions. And so what I've done is the heavy lifting. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying I did the heavy lifting. Some of you can take over this work. I don't want to be the only person doing it. I shouldn't be the only person doing it. And I want other people to be critical of it, to be looking at what I'm looking at, to take those studies and jump off into other studies and ask more questions. Because if this is a whole community thing, then we all are served by it. But if you see something that is conflicting and you want to bring it to my attention or whatever, then just ask the question or tag me on the forum or whatever. But if you're just curious or you just have a question, or you just want to know, well, why does this study say this and that study says that? Or why do you say this and it conflicts with this study? There are conflicting things. I'm going to explain a lot of them here. You see what I'm saying? All right, I belabored the point. I'm not trying to be an asshole. I just hope you understand the constraints of my time. I'm doing my best. I want to get to all the comments, but it's just hard and I'm trying. <laughs> I'm just one person. <laughs> all right, if you like this in the fact that I've done this work for you, buy me a coffee because I need the caffeine, please. Thank you. Link to that is in the description. All right, so firstly, you have to know the field of study for mycology and metals and the uptake of chemicals is called geomycology. It is a thing. And if you think this is interesting, maybe it's something you would like to get into. The basics of heavy metals are this. Just because it's a heavy metal doesn't mean it's bad for you. Just because it's a heavy metal in a mushroom you're consuming doesn't mean it is available to your body, bioavailability. Just because it is a heavy metal that's not good for you, that is biologically available in the mushroom, doesn't mean that it's going to be toxic in the levels that you're consuming it. Just because you've heard that Amanitas can bio uptake a toxic heavy metal that's available to your body doesn't mean that Amanita muscaria can do it. A lot of the heavy metals 
that or a lot of metals in general that Amanita take up are actually good for you. Secondly, the two major studies that everyone throws around and talks about and says, oh my God, Amanita takes up heavy metals that are toxic, stay away from it. This is where reading is important. Those studies were done in a highly industrial, toxic region of Poland. Poland manufacturing for the fifth to the 10th centuries was mostly done with iron, and they were curious about what the mushrooms were doing in that area. And it just so happens that Amanita muscaria grow crazy wild there. So those were some of the ones that were in the study, right? So this is where logic. There's also another study done on an area of a power plant in Macedonia called Oslomej. Os That's the area where this power plant was. So you'll see that study also, but it was in an area where there's a power plant with a lot of runoff. What we're trying to do is say, okay, if that's how it is in highly toxic areas of industry, how then do we extrapolate that information to where we are? Because it, then you have to look at the growth patterns of Amanita. So we know that Amanita muscaria in Europe grow in the forest, away from industry. And that in the Americas, a lot of ours tend to grow by the road and trails and heavily trafficked areas. And so people see me picking by the side of the road and they're like, oh my God, that's crazy. Aren't you worried about the toxins and the pollution and the poisons? So that then is a fair question, right? So let's talk then about what we're worried about in the Americas or wherever you are if you're getting your Amanita from the side of the road. So what you're looking at is called road dust. And that stuff washes off the road and into the ground in these areas. So what metals are in road dust? All right, so the heavy metals that are in road dust are lead, zinc, copper, cadmium, and nickel. And a lot of that, like lead especially, in the Americas has shown a really sharp decrease in the last 20 years. So we can take lead off the list of being potentially harmful and hazardous. I'm not saying that just because of that one statement. I'm saying that because of the research and the studies of the metals that are currently showing up in the most recent studies from two years ago, the lead levels were barely noticeable. So that's because of that. But also pay attention when you look at some of these studies from car exhaust and street dust, they were done in China in 2004 in super heavy pollution states of China, Istanbul, and again, the heavy metals, they were in really levels of high concentrations of toxin, toxins and toxic environments. And then I don't know when Turkey or China regulated leaded gas or if they have, but the United States, but zinc, copper, cadmium, and nickel are what we're worried about from street runoff. Then the next thing that we're worried about is going to be spraying, right? So I'm very careful about that because if you can be, why wouldn't you be? So one of the things I do is I pay attention to areas that where there's spraying going on and it's good for you to do the same. And I don't take anything from any areas where spraying is going on. So you can tell by looking at it, if it's being cut regularly, they're not spraying most likely because they're cutting it. If you can see in the middle of summer when everything is really green and lots of vegetation and then an area just starts turning brown and dying, that has been sprayed. Make note of it and if you see any Amanita there in, that, in the fall later that year, just leave it. There's no reason to deal with it. But I'm very careful about where I forage and I'm always looking through the year when I'm driving around at areas that are being sprayed and areas that are not and what that looks like, and I make note of it. I don't even drive in those areas. If I notice an area is being sprayed, it doesn't even show up on my radar in my mind to even drive by that area when I'm looking for Amanita. The areas that I pick from, I know those areas, or I know how to read the area, read the land, and know whether those areas have been sprayed or not. That's just something I stick to, because why not? But let's talk about spray. What metals are in herbicides? Cadmium, cobalt, chromium, mercury, lead, and arsenic. So these are very similar to the metals that are in your street dust. So let's talk about these metals and their bioavailability. So let's take the first thing and that is that a lot of you are going to say, well, you need to deal in your heavy metal load. You need to get tested. You need 
to do chelation therapy, whatever. I've had people tell me that autism is because of heavy metal poisoning, like all kinds of ableist crap. So let me take a moment to say, if you're doing anything at home that you're calling a natural remedy that is chelation therapy, you are not. To truly get heavy metals out of your body, you do need modern medicine for that. If you feel like you have a heavy metal toxicity, and if you feel like it's something you need to do chelation therapy for, I can promise you, whatever you've read that tells you that you can do it on your own is pseudoscience. It is a scary process, and it is not something anyone should take lightly or enter into and actually really do, unless your life is threatened by heavy metal poisoning or toxicity because the process that you have to go through is about as hard on your body as chemotherapy is to try to kill cancer. It is highly dangerous, and it has to be monitored and done by a doctor, well, a team of doctors that specialize in this, and it can kill you if it's not done right. So can we just, okay, about chelation therapy? It's a pseudoscience that you can just do some things at home and it's just gonna take heavy metals out of your body. That's that. Secondly, any detox diet or tea is not gonna touch heavy metals. Arsenic, to get arsenic poisoning, you ha we actually need arsenic in our bodies in certain levels, which means our body is good at dealing with low levels of arsenic and moving it. You get arsenic poisoning when you can't move it fast enough, faster than you're taking it in. The only way you're gonna get that much arsenic is if you are exposed to a lot of it, like someone's doping your food with it in large amounts, because it is something your body needs. And when you're dealing in a compound your body needs, a metal or something that your body needs, that means your body is in motion with it. That means it's not one of those things that's just gonna get in your body and stay forever. It's something your body can move and excrete and expel. So it's not one of those things that you can get arsenic, heavy metal toxicity that just sits around and builds up over a lifetime. Arsenic is one of those things you will get rid of. So you would have to eat an incredible amount of amanitas from a highly toxic place to get acute arsenic poisoning. However, if you're concerned about it, symptoms of arsenic exposure, chronic, long-term, high levels of arsenic, is diarrhea, thickening of the skin, discoloration of the skin, corns and warts on the palms, soles, and midsection, nausea, abnormal heartbeat, numbness in hands and feet, partial paralysis, blindness, drowsiness, and seizures. Cadmium is a heavy metal that can get in your body and stick around and it's hard to get it out of your body because it's not a heavy metal that our bodies need. However, cadmium is one of those things that you need heavy amounts of exposure over a very long period of time. And if you work in a cadmium, excuse me, industry, then that's a problem. So when we talk about exposure to heavy metals, keep in mind that your daily life exposes you to heavy metals. There are heavy metals in toothpaste and makeup and car exhaust and herbicides and stuff like that. I got a list here, uh, deodorant and some creams and some cookware, but not as much. The thing is we've known about heavy metals for a long time, so we are doing better about it. My point is a really bad one and a fatalistic one, and that is if I'm gonna worry about trace amounts of heavy metals in a mushroom, but I'm not worried about breathing the air at the interstate, at a city, going shopping or makeup that I put on or dyes that are in my clothing, then I'm just choosing. I'm just choosing to not be bothered by one and be bothered by another. The truth is I'm bothered by it all. And I try to live my life in a way that I am exposed to less chronically because this stuff can build up. And so if you're just living your life, well, especially back in the 50s and 60s, that was just a big mess of chronic exposure to heavy metals and other toxins and poisons. But now in 2020 with the regulations and in industry, we are we have a lot less of it, but it's still there. 
is still a problem. It's just much less of a problem. But my point in saying this is, if you're going to freak out and get hyper crazy about the fact that I'm picking and using Mammonita on the side of the road, but you're eating lots of processed foods and using herbicides and fungicides and you're killing bugs with sprays and you're wearing clothing and you have carpeting and you have furniture that's off gassing and you wear makeup or you wear cologne or you wear deodorant or you use shampoos and conditioners that were manufactured that you didn't make yourself out of lye and fat like you are exposed to so much more heavy metal i'm not saying that's a good justification i'm just saying get your house in order and then come at me about the heavy metals in Amanitas. This is cool. I found a study that measured the amount of heavy metals in the cap of Amanita muscarias from when they were buttons all the way up to maturity. All right, so you can take a screenshot of this if you want to. These metals were in the caps when they were young, but they weren't left there when they were, they reduced to very small amounts by the time it was mature. So rubidium, cesium, lead, SB is antimony, tellurium, and barium. So those are ones we don't have to worry about. These saw very little change from when they were little to where they were large, and that's copper, zinc, magnesium, and manganese, cadmium, silver, arsenic, manganese, selenium, and vanadium. So that's an interesting little side note. But again, these metals are found in areas of high industry and high pollution. And remember the metals that we talked about that we will find on the side of the road. But again, we're going through those metals and talking about which ones are okay for your body that your body can work them through. How many of them are gonna be in actually really high levels? And then the amount of high levels you need to be exposed to before it's considered toxic and damaging to your body. Then there's a thing that is it even bioavailable? Can your body actually take it in and use it? And all of them that are not on the list that we've already checked off, the answer is no. They're not in a, in a form that can be used by the body. The one that's left, the one metal that's left, is vanadium. And the vanadium that is in Amanita is in a compound called amavadin. And it's really cool, really cool, because amavadin is used in the mycelium, they believe, to repair tissue damage. And in, when it's really small, it can still use that to repair the tissue. Now, obviously, if it get atta gets attacked by insects or snail, as it's growing, it's not going to be able to do that. It's less available in the mushroom itself for tissue damage repair than it is in the mycelium, but it will do that when it's younger. And then in our body, we take that and break it down and we can turn it into vanadium, but it is not a toxin, a heavy metal toxin. We need vanadium in our bodies, which means yet again, it's one of those metals that we can filter and get rid of and that we do need. And so what does vanadium do in the human body? There are theories and research that suggests that vanadium helps in boost our immune system and reduce inflammation. So that would make sense if we are seeing these effects that it's not just contaminated areas that Amanita pulls vanadium out of the soil, but it actually searches for vanadium which is found in trace amounts in soil. It actually looks for vanadium and pulls it out of the soil because it wants to use it for tissue repair and it wants to put it in the caps of the mushroom where we eat it and it has a positive effect on our immune system. That is this. If you wanna look at any of these studies, go to the forum, links are in the description. Check out the merch shelf. Christmas merch is out. Smoke blends go in the store and get restocked again on December 1st. They sell out quickly. Follow the store, elect to get notifications, and anytime I make more, you'll get notified. I love you, beautiful people. Bye.